Hello, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, Martin Roscoe, who is um, an astonishing um, concert pianist and also a professor um, uh, at Guildhall uh, School for Music and Drama. Hello, Martin. Thank you very much uh, for hello, joining Julia. me. Hello, hello. I'm deli delighted to join you and uh, very happy to chat. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, uh, look, um, this this is uh, strange times for everyone, and of course, I would like to ask you how have you been in these very strange times? Uh, well, of course, all my concerts have been cancelled uh, or rather postponed, at the very least, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I'm suspecting at least until next year, although I still have some dates in my diary for the autumn of this year. Um, but I haven't been idle. Uh, I've been revising the Bach Goldberg variations, which I haven't played since the year 2000. Uh, well, I've taught it many times in, in between. And also the Hammerklavier Sonata, which I recorded um, in 2011, but that recording yet to be released. So I thought this was an ideal opportunity to Mm. to climb those two uh, uh, huge peaks. Yeah. Um, I've also been teaching online. Uh, my students at the Guildhall have sent me either video recordings or audio, audio recordings, or in, in some cases I've done FaceTime or Zoom lessons. So uh, I, I've also taken the opportunity to, uh, because I live, uh, I, well, I've got two very, very, very happy to have two different uh, places one I rent in the Lake District and one I own in Scotland mm -hmm. and uh, I, I find myself in the Lake District for the lockdown and I'm very happy to be here it's a wonderful part of the country and I'm able to get out for quite long walks so I'm mm. beginning to get a bit fitter <laughs> Well, there's some positives currently in this current yes. situation. Yes. But well, of course, it's very diff It's a very difficult time for everybody, and I, I you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, I am fortunate in that the, you know, the financially, uh, the, the government are helping me and many other self-employed people, and I do have some backup, uh, but it won't last indefinitely. Uh, but I, I mean, my heart goes out to all the people who are really struggling, the musicians, uh, and it's a very worrying time for the industry as a whole because. We don't know how it's going to end yet. Yeah. Uh, which leads me to the next question. Do you have any prognosis about the situation? Uh, well, it all depends on, on the virus itself, it seems to me, because uh, there's this current debate about uh, uh, the, the rate of the lockdown being eased uh, and whether we should have a two metre distancing rule. Uh, I, I must say I prefer the, to be on the side of caution but although I understand all the difficulties that uh, over caution brings, uh, I, I think also maybe um, the risk factor is, uh, you know, for the vast majority of the population, there is very little risk of serious illness. Uh, on the other hand, we don't want to lose any lives. So yeah. th these are very difficult questions. I, 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 and I struggle in my own mind with some of those things, but I, I think that, um, We've got to be very careful to get uh, the, the testing and tracing uh, very firmly in place. And that doesn't seem to be happening very quickly. Mm, sure, sure. Um, so um, you, of course, um, as, as many, and you've just said it in your you know, opening statement that all the concerts were cancelled. But do you have any projects um, that are um, or will take um, basically basically they will be in a different format, um, let's say online or maybe social distancing, something like that? Uh, not at the moment, no. I mean, I'm in discussion with one or two of the uh, places which have offered me recitals to talk about these matters, uh, but there's, it's all very much up in the air. And mm -hmm. every venue is different. Uh, you know, how many people can we get into the, the Albert Hall? And not that I'm, I've got anything there, but uh, uh, the Royal Northern College of Music, I've got a couple of concerts in there in the autumn. And, you know, they have to decide really, ha you know, if those concerts can take place with some form of social distancing with a smaller audience. Uh, these are all things that we, which are constantly under discussion. Sure. Uh, I've sure. also been busy trying to uh, get one or two recordings of mine out there, which uh, are sort of in slightly in abeyance. And uh, 
uh, I've managed to I found a studio recording that I made of uh, um, music by Brahms 20 years ago, which has never seen the light of day. And I'm very pleased to say that that is going to come out. I mean, not very soon, but uh, the, the, um, the record company that I've been working with for several years now, Dazelle, uh, are going to take that. And also a live Chopin recital that I gave oh. in 1999. Uh, I, originally, I, I was uh, I was a little bit um, worried about it because the, because it was a live concert. There were a, a few minor flaws, but I, when I listened again after almost twenty years, I thought, well, artistically, I'm very happy with it. So I think the public should listen. Uh, well, should have the opportunity to listen mm -hmm. to it. Well, that's marvelous. Uh, but may I ask how it was possible that uh, these were for such a long time in your cupboard, let's say? <laughs> uh, well, the, the Brahms was commissioned by a recording company, but it never saw the light of day. And I'd just forgotten about it, to be honest. And I found a, a CD of the first edit. Uh, and, and I thought, well, this, I, I think this is good and I should try and get it out there as soon as possible and I managed to get permission from the technically the owners of it that they weren't going to put it out and that I could do with it what I wanted to do without any mm. further charge. Uh, the other one as I said I think that was likewise I, uh, it was a live performance I listened to it at the time and thought mm, not quite good enough but now I've got a different view in it uh, because I, you know artistically that's what's more important to me now maybe than the, the actual technical perfection it is a live concert so I'm very happy with it. So I think um, you know you've touched a very important point. I think for many listeners mm -hmm. that um, that the sort of wrong notes or flaws are they are basically not important, right? So the, the kind of the wiser you become, the more mature, the more you of course value the artistic side of things, right? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I, I've, I've always been a tremendous admirer of the recordings that Alfred Corto made in the 1930s and 40s, uh, which are very flawed uh, pianistically uh, at times uh, because he, he took so many risks. But I don't think anyone would doubt that these are amongst the greatest uh, examples of piano playing that we're able to listen to on disc. Uh, and, uh, of course, now we do have the, the facility to make things perfect. But sometimes I think uh, that's gone a little bit too far and, and people have been concentrating just on the perfection of the pianism rather than art artistic matters. And I, I think my time, my feeling has changed over the years about that. So let's uh, sort of um, s summarize. So basically, if you, let's say, sit in a jury or in a festival adjudicating, yeah. you won't judge harshly. I think it will light many, many of the hearts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I don't. I don't judge harshly if there are a few mistakes. I think that there comes a point at which you've got to, uh, you've got to take those into account. If there are, you know, a lot of if there's a lot of evidence of uh, performance anxiety or um, a lot of memory slips, uh, but then. Uh, you know, you've got to have the balance in your mind. What's more important, that someone who has something to say uh, needs to be heard, or we're just listening to someone who's just a perfect professional uh, and I think it's the artistic matters have to come first yeah. and I, I do take that into account when I'm judging yes yes well uh, you've touched another interesting topic about being nervous and all these kind of things mm. happening as a result of being nervous um, so um, are you yourself or were you let's say a nervous performer at some point of your life uh, I think it's gone uh, in uh, waves in my own case. And I think certainly I've experienced performance anxiety. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I've managed usually to conquer those and, and to give uh, professional uh, performances and, you know, even exciting and artistically satisfying performances. I think I wouldn't still be a busy pianist if I wasn't yeah. able to do that. Sure. Um, uh, certainly, you know, I mean, I, I once played Rachmaninoff's second concerto at the proms, for example, and, uh, you know, I, I, you can imagine walking out onto the stage of the Royal Albert Hall on a, a, a August bank holiday Saturday evening with 6,000 people looking at you. Uh, I had to conquer my performance anxiety, uh, and I, I have a, I'm very pleased, with, I have a recording of that performance, I'm very pleased with it. But uh, there have been times when I've been full of doubt and wondering whether, it's worth it, you know, to, to put yourself through the difficulties really? of preparation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, going back a long time. Uh, one thing, a decision I made about 10 years ago was that I, I wasn't going to play from memory anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Uh, it's seven years ago, actually, uh, since I last played anything from memory in a concert. And I that has meant that uh, I, I still get a little bit nervous. I still suffer from performance anxiety. It depends on what the piece is and how often I've played that work. For example, only three or four years ago, I played the Ravel left-hand concerto for the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I was certainly, even though the score was there, I was certainly... Uh, worried about that but um, it, it's meant that I enjoy my performances more I, I feel more spontaneous I feel I'm able to convey what I want to convey and what I believe the composer wants to convey also um, and I think for the very vast majority I, I get a very good reaction from audiences no mm -hmm. I don't get any complaints <laughs> Uh, I get lots of re-invitations, even though I've played a Beethoven recital with the score in front of me. I think times are changing in this regard. And I know I talk about this a lot with all my colleagues. Mm -hmm. and I'm very fortunate that currently in the UK, um, uh, lots of my uh, pianist friends are able to talk about these things. You know, Paul Lewis, Stephen Huff, Peter Donahoe, Ronan O'Hora. We, we, we can get to the, Stephen Osborne. We can get to the nitty gritty and, you know, to, it's a more of a collegiate atmosphere than it was when I was in my early 20s. And, um, you know, I think we all are aware uh, of this being a difficulty with some of us. I mean, my great friend Catherine Stott, uh, a few years ago, she said to me in 1996, I remember the conversation very well. She said, I've decided I am not playing from memory anymore. Uh, she said, I've done it all my life up to this point and I'm going to enjoy the rest of my career. Uh, it took me about another 13 years to get around to exactly the same decision, but I'm very happy I did it. Very interesting, and of course, oh, yeah. uh, there are these iPads and pedals, everything. So, do you yeah. just use a normal score or an iPad? Or uh, 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 no, uh, uh, Paul Lewis told me uh, a year or so ago that he started to use an iPad uh, with a pedal, and um, I know there are other colleagues who, who've gone down that route. I'm heading in that direction, but I can usually find that with some discrete photocopying, I don't need a page turner. Mm -hmm. I, I need a page turner if I'm working with chamber music because sure. uh, you know there is, you've got the score there so there's not so many notes per page as it were so uh, almost everything I've played in the last seven years I've managed to get photocopying sorted out so that I can turn my own pages so that the audience don't have the distraction of the page turn sure. um, but certainly the iPad is, is a useful device and um, I, I'm, I, I've been dithering a bit, actually, <laughs> about whether I, but I, I'm sure that uh, the time is coming that I will start to use. Yeah, it's just a bit nerve-wracking. I mean, I use the the iPad, and um, I can tell you, it's uh, every time you need to press that pedal, your heart stops for a second. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, other people have said the same, yes. Uh, may I ask you about your beginnings? Um, how did you yep. sort of get into your piano playing? Um, and... Yeah, um, well, I, I, I'm from uh, near Liverpool, um, Merseyside, and uh, uh, in my family, I have two older brothers, and my parents were uh, not musicians, but they were scientists, but they, they both loved music. My mum played the piano, uh, and my dad played the violin and the saxophone. Uh, so there was music in the house, the piano was in the house. Um, my brothers, both being older than me, they had lessons obviously before I did. And we just went to the local teacher, like a few hundred yards from home. And um, I'd been going for about six months, I think. And the teacher said to my mum, well, I don't think Martin's as good as his brothers. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, and uh, when I was just seven years old, um, the whole family went down to London for a week for a holiday in the summer of 1959. And uh, the first night we went to a prom and uh, it was um, the BBC Symphony Orchestra, Malcolm Sargent, Sir Malcolm Sargent, and also the main work, which really blew me away, uh, was the Berlioz Symphonie Fantastique. The sound of it, the, the spectacle of it, I just was so excited by it. And when we got back to Liverpool, just a week later, near Liverpool, Runcorn precisely, um, I, they, they say, my parents always said they, I was just on the piano the whole time. And I, I sort of taught myself to read 
And I would just pick up a book and go at it and go at it. And I used to listen to the radio. My parents bought me recordings, vinyl recordings in those days, uh, orchestral music and piano music. And uh, that was what set me off, really. Um, the rest is history, really. I changed teachers uh, when I was 12 and went to, I had two fantastic teachers in Manchester. And I went to the Royal Manchester College of Music when I was just 16. And that uh, four years later became the Royal Northern College of Music. And I did two years there. But by which time I was already getting quite a few concerts and, you know, people had heard me and, and were showing interest. That, well, that was how I started, really. And um, so no one pushed you to practice, really. So you were one of those children that all the parents dream about. <laughs> Do you know, I don't think anyone's ever said that to me before. But uh, you, no, you're absolutely right. I never, I never had to be told to do it. No, never. Not for a moment. And I, I was also very fortunate in that my parents were very supportive and, and not too pushy. Uh, I, I think my mum was, you know, very proud of my abilities and, you know, what I was doing and so on. Uh, and just occasionally, years later, maybe she might be saying, you know, well, you know, so and so is playing at the proms. Why aren't you? Sort of thing. But I was already in my twenties. I was already my own person by then. And eventually, I did get to play at the proms, and she heard me there. So, uh, uh, but I, I think sometimes parents can do things which are not helpful uh, in some circumstances with a young musician. Uh, and I, I mean, I never went to a specialist music school. I've nothing against those places, but um, uh, in fact, you know, I, I go into some of them to work and uh, and help the students there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, I had a, a sort of, in inverted commas, normal school schooling with the local grammar school near Chester, Helsby High School, it's now called, where there was very little music actually. But I just ploughed my own path, and uh, you know, I, I was so taken up by the music and you know curious about it as well as passionate uh, and I, I never thought it was work going to practice it, 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 I mean my dear late colleague Peter Cropper the violinist who I was in a trio with for 10 years he used to say work I've never done a day's work in my life <laughs> and I still think of it like that Wonderful. That's actually very inspiring and it's also a very healthy attitude. But I must ask you about these hours that everyone must um, put in if a pianist. So, yeah. Um, yeah. When did you start really playing these hard hours and what were, let's say, the longest hours? And let's say, what was your routine, if you remember, when you were a teenager? When I was a teenager, well, of course, I had to go to school mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, the, the, the practicing had to go around that and uh, I, I mean it's a long unfortunately it's a long time ago Julia but uh, I, I think I probably used to play two to three hours mm -hmm. a day most days at the weekend perhaps a bit more uh, I never timed myself I knew what I had to do and I also was exploring other pieces that I wanted to put into my repertoire mm -hmm. as well uh, and lots of reading um, which uh, I think has been very beneficial in, in my career. So, uh, and, and it made, it's sort of made me learn quick, helped me to learn quickly as well. Yeah. Um, I, I always say to my students now that you shouldn't really do more than four hours mm -hmm. a day, just for the, the, the sake of your brain, you know, the concentration you do and, and do it in, uh, take breaks you know do half an hour and then have 10 minutes make a cup of coffee do a couple of emails um, go out for a walk at lunchtime if you've got a complete day which sometimes well mm -hmm. of course at the moment we all have complete days don't we yeah. but I, I was very uh, I remember um, when I worked at the Royal Academy there, I had a, a postgraduate a Japanese student um, who was very dedicated very hardworking, and very musical and I was helping her to prepare for her final master's recital. And I just noticed that as we approached the date of the recital, uh, she was already well prepared like two months before. Mm -hmm. that The playing became more and more detached and, mm -hmm. and tired and, uh, and started to get mistakes which had never happened before. And I said to her, you know, what's going on here? You know, you, mm -hmm. yeah. this is not, not going well. And, and whereas you, two months ago you were ready. And she said, I said, how, how long are you practicing for? She said, oh, 10 hours a day. 
And I said to her, well, look, I said, I want you to promise me that you do no more than three hours a day for the next week and take plenty of rests. And uh, I don't often get to hear my students play their final recitals, but I did hear her. And um, uh, she played brilliantly, got a very high mark. And uh, my colleague at the time, Aaron Shaw, who's the, currently the um, head of keyboard in, in Glasgow, was on the panel. And he was sitting next to Hamish Milne, who unfortunately just died if, two or three months ago. Uh, also a colleague, and a very good colleague of mine at the Royal Academy. And apparently Hamish turned to Aaron when this girl was playing, Psycho, she was called. And um, he said to me, he, he said to Aaron, oh, how is it we've not heard this girl before in the Academy? She's great. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a lesson for me, really, that I, I should have detected this overworking a little bit earlier. And uh, I, I'm very keen to tell my students now, just don't do it, because I, don't, I think it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still, as a teenager, you probably had to practice quite hard, no? I don't remember. Oh, that's I really, nice. really don't remember. <laughs> wow. I remember, I remember listening to lots of Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Haydn symphonies and Mahler and mm. uh, Bruckner symphonies and getting to know these pieces. Yeah, and I did, I, I did, obviously did plenty of practice, but I, I never regarded it as a, some, a routine that I had to do. Oh. Sure. Very interesting. And um, so tell me, did you do any kind of grades or exams or something like that? Uh, when I was with my very first teacher, I did the Trinity exams. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a bit more focused on me doing that and getting my scales right than she was on me playing the Volstein Sonata, which I took to her one day. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, when I changed teachers, uh, nothing for a couple of years. I just did my grade eight associated board. Um, which was successful um, and then I went to college almost immediately after that age just 16 um, and obviously I had to progress through the exams there. Interesting so what was um, uh, let's say the biggest kind of influence uh, in those years was it um, maybe let's say um, a recital you attended a concerto performance you attended? Uh, yeah well I think uh, when I was just uh, in my first two years at college, I went to several amazing recitals by top pianists. Um, I, I also became very interested in the playing of Alfred Brendel, who had just arrived at, into the UK late 60s. And his recordings, his very first recordings, uh, were just becoming available uh, uh, in this country. And I, I collected a lot of those and I found them very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I subsequently played to him in master class and learned a tremendous amount from that. So that's one person, I think, mm -hmm. who, who made a big impact. Uh, actually, I heard Rubenstein play five times. And um, the, the concerts were generally a bit mixed. You know, some of the pieces went well, some of them sounded a bit rough. But there was always, well, there were, there were always several wonderful things in each of those concerts. Mm -hmm. um, Radu Lupu had just won the Leeds piano competition. He was doing a lot of touring in the UK after that. And I tried to get to every one of his concerts because I found his, his sound, his imagination, and the style also in the classical repertoire and some of the romantic repertoire to be just amazing. Still the best Greek concerto I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 get, he dropped the piece when he was about 30 and said he didn't want to play it anymore. <laughs> but it, it was amazing playing. Um, the one that I still remember every note of was Richter. Mm. He came to play in Liverpool and um, uh, it was quite a funny, I was studying by this time with Gordon Green, who was a great teacher and pedagogue. Uh, in, uh, he lived in Liverpool, but he, he taught at the Royal Northern and in the Royal Academy in London. And uh, he said to me, uh, Martin, you're going to hear Richter, aren't you? And I said, well, I thought about it, but I, I don't like the programme very much. Oh. The programme was, uh, Schubert's variations on a theme of Hüttenbrenner, which I didn't know. Um, and uh, you've got to bear in mind I was only 16 here. Uh, the Schumann um, fantasy Stücke up was 12, but Richter didn't like two of them. So he, didn't, he only was playing six. And even his recording, he didn't record them all. 
Uh, and Ten Rachmaninoff Preludes, a selection from both books, which I, you know, in my ignorance and, you know, you might even say arrogance, I thought, well, why isn't he playing either one set or the other sort of thing? Anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I went to the concert and from the first chord, I was absolutely transfixed by the sound that Richter gave and there was this incredible magnetism and energy in his playing and tremendous poetry as well like you don't always associate his playing on disc with the, that quality but i think live that was certainly an amazing experience so i think when i was in my around between 16 and 22 i'd say those were the major influences those four pianists that's fascinating. I mean, all those four, um, that's uh, yeah, unbelievable, really. Um, mm. So let's talk about your repertoire. You know, you have a really a huge repertoire. Um, so did you just think that, you know, because some people are now specializing, you know, and, and they, mm. let's say they only play sort of Baroque music. Uh, so uh, were you actually ever at a point of specializing or just, I just thought it's so wonderful to have so much repertoire um i, I always wanted to play a very broad repertoire mm -hmm. I, I think as uh, in the last few years i there are some pieces that i don't want to play anymore um partly because i've never been quite comfortable that they're necessarily me you know i don't really want to play rachmaninoff concertos anymore um i, I love them and i enjoy teaching them uh i never felt terribly comfortable with them there are some composers like what other composers like Prokofiev. I mean, I, I love some of his sonatas to bits, but uh, I never felt that they I could do justice to them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, I mean, almost every other of the major one of the other major all the other major composers you, you can think of. I've I've played. I mean, I mentioned right at the beginning of this interview, the Goldberg variations. I've not played a lot of Bach in public, but I am starting to do more now. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's. Going. And I, I think um, I, I'm still very, very happy to play Beethoven, Schubert, Mozart, Haydn, uh, Brahms, Schumann, Debussy, Chopin. Yeah, and there's so much to do. Liszt as well, because I mean, I'm a, a huge fan of Liszt. Uh, there's plenty to go out there. But I've also uh, been delving into the byways, especially on disc. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you've probably seen that I've recorded all the piano music of Doc Nanyi yeah. and Shimonovsky, Nielsen. Uh, and these are composers, I think, are still a little bit neglected to their piano music and, and need, need to be heard a bit more often. And how did you discover those? Did you just went in the library or...? Uh, I... I... I think it, each case is different. I mean, I, I love the Nielsen symphonies, so it was a, quite a, an easy move to explore his piano music. I mean, I think there are only two discs worth, and not all of it is up to the standard of the symphonies, but there are some really great pieces. Um, Chiminovsky, I always thought was a very interesting composer, uh, eclectic, and he, you know, he moves from a sort of Scriabin, Chopin-esque via Richard Strauss and Liszt, Debussy, and then he finds his own voice with his the, the folk the folk idioms of Poland in his last music. Um, and yes, I, I think I did discover that for myself. And I was very fortunate that uh, Naxos actually asked me if I was interested to, in recording those. Dochnani, again, I discovered his four rhapsodies, the famous C major one, which I still think is an amazingly um, exhilarating piece. And uh, I, I thought I would like to try and, and see if I could play all his music. And Hyperion were very happy to uh, help me uh, fulfill that. So uh, I think a mixture of, you know, what I've heard, what I've listened to and my own explorations, uh, that's, that's the way it's gone. I mean, I, my concerto repertoire has been absolutely huge as well. And uh, often that has been a case of the BBC have been incredibly helpful there. You know, they've often offered me, especially when I was younger, you know, uh, are you interested in playing the Vaughan Williams piano concerto? Well, you know, my diary wasn't so packed and uh, I love the Vaughan Williams symphonies. So, yes, of course. Um, and I, I think my, you know, tally of concertos is well over 100 uh, that I've actually either recorded or performed live. Wow. I, I, I was like nearly lost for words. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, so it's really incredible. But I wanted to talk now about a little bit your career. Um, yeah. So has there been a real boost or was it just like, let's say, a steady growth and it just developed? I, I say a steady growth uh, that's uh, developed. I think um, quite early on, I was taken up by the BBC. They didn't have the new generation scheme in those days, which has operated now for about 20 years. You had to audition, uh, you had to make a recording, which was assessed by uh, people who weren't watching you, just on a music, purely uh, musical level. And uh, when I was 28, I was accepted by the BBC as being good enough to broadcast on Radio 3. And I've been a regular there ever since, really. Um, I, I've rather lost count of how many times I've broadcast now. But certainly um, b being able to uh, play with, with the concertos with the BBC orchestras has been an enormous thing for me. And proms as well, of course. Uh, but I think overall, it's been a, a very steady thing. And um, I was sort of expecting that when I got beyond the age of 60, um, uh, things would uh, take a, a quite a quick decline, but that hasn't been the case. And uh, I'm still, you know, still as busy as ever, except for current circumstances, obviously. Sure. And um, so nowadays, it's it's very sort of strange, at least amongst younger people, there's sort of this belief that you have to make it by the age of like 25, you know, you have to yeah. um, win a competition or something. What's your attitude towards that? Uh, well, I, th I think it's a very bad attitude to have that if you haven't made it by the age of 25, you should give up and do something else. Uh, I, I think if you're a real musician and really passionate about music, that will sustain you be way beyond that age. Uh, there may well come a time when you think, well, look, I've just got so little work, I need to find an income from doing something else. Uh, that, and that's unfortunate. And I mean, I regard myself as, as being incredibly fortunate that I've been able to do what I love doing um, until now. Uh, and there are many, many talented people more talented than me, in my view, who haven't had either the opportunity or for one reason or another, maybe some difficulties with personality or, you know, some mental health issues in some way or another, who haven't been able to fulfill their, their, their own talent. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, I've had the career I've had. But certainly, um, what one very important point, Yulia, I think, is that you've got to have time to build your repertoire. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I just think of uh, Maurizio Pellini, who won the Chopin competition aged 18. And for various reasons, he, he went into a sort of, uh, uh, not retirement isn't the right word, but he, he shut himself away for seven or eight years. Didn't do any concerts, but he was working furiously to build up a huge repertoire. Mm -hmm. And then when he came out again of that in, um, in his late 20s, he was able to build on that not only is it incredible talent, but all the hard work that he'd done in the meantime. But if you're suddenly presented age 21 with a huge diary full of engagements playing every concerto in, under the sun, it's very tempting to take all of those opportunities. And some people do do that. Mm -hmm. But it's almost a guarantee for a burnout, I think, mm -hmm. and not for a long career. And if you look at some of the greatest pianists in the past who are still full diaries in their 70s and even 80s, you know, Claudio Arrau just came into my mind as one perfect example. Well, how come he had such an enormous repertoire? It's because he wasn't shooting around the world on tour, age 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. He was in the studio working, building his repertoire. Yeah, and because, of course, one tends to program pieces that you feel most comfortable with. And it's inevitable that if you have a lot of engagements, um, um, you just tend to play sort of same repertoire, especially if you're yes. younger. Um, yeah, yeah. What is your... That's very dangerous. Mm, I think that's a very dangerous thing. You end up playing the same pieces you played when you were 16 and never getting beyond that. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to mention any names, but I can think of several examples of extremely talented pianists who, you know, have unfortunately not progressed as far as their talent deserves just because of that very point. Interesting. That's. I think that's a big, uh, big point for everyone who is listening. But I also would like to ask about competitions. So now everyone's mm. mad about competitions. Maybe now a little bit less, but let's say five years mm. ago for sure. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I, I didn't do very many competitions. I didn't enjoy them very much. Uh, I think I did four. I won prizes in two of them. I didn't win a pr uh, the first prize. Um, I, I don't discourage my students from entering competitions. I, I think to some extent you you do learn how to control your performance anxiety a bit more if you you know put yourself on in that position but it is very dangerous to just go from one competition to another just along the lines we were talking about just now having your, your one shop and etude your one bar prelude and fugue mm. and so on and so forth your two concertos oh. and if you end up uh, even if you you know win a big competition age 28 and you have only ever played three concertos this isn't good news so I think it's finding a balance and I think there are plenty of examples of, of very successful pianists who've you know not done many competitions and maybe some who've not even won a competition um, did Evgeny Kissin ever win a competition for example uh, Lang Lang did he uh, win a competition he probably did didn't he uh, he, he, he won um, the Tchaikovsky Junior actually exactly what I won which right. was very different yeah. <laughs> Right. But, uh, Yuji Wang also didn't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's perfectly possible to, to be very successful without winning any. Um, and uh, one pianist who I, it interests me a lot at the moment is Igor Levitt. I mean, mm. is he a competition man? Uh, no. Has he won competition? I don't think so. I'm not sure, but I can't. Yeah. I will look later. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting what he, he's doing. Like quite, quite mm. uh, astonishing, in fact, especially this. Absolutely. Episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, of course, um, I think uh, one other point of, of, of interest to, to many is um, how do you practice? If you have any routine or let's say, how do you go back to pieces you've played? Maybe how do you learn new repertoire? Uh... Yeah, it's uh, I, I'm not learning. I'm not learning much re new repertoire these days. Uh, you know, in fact, it did occur to me at the beginning of the lockdown that maybe this was an opportunity to learn a big new major piece that I've always wanted to learn, which I haven't done so far. And, and to be honest with you, I be, and what would that? Well, I don't know. That's the well. That's the trouble. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of one. I mean, well, the, the one just one piece which I never have played but which I think is one of Liszt's greatest uh, piano pieces is the Dante Sonata and I've taught it many times I've never played it but I, I, I thought well at my age maybe I shouldn't be learning all those octaves oh. and things uh, <laughs> and uh, I decided instead to revise as I said at the beginning the, the Goldbergs and the Hand Club um, but if uh, if I'm revisiting new, uh, if I'm revisiting pieces from my repertoire, um, I, I will, you know, take my time with them. And I don't have a routine as such, but I do use the metronome a lot as a way of forcing myself to practice slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a, a sort of impatience detector if you like you know you, you uh, or pr protector against impatience uh, so that you you can sort of really get the brain and the fingers working properly at a, an easy speed even if you've played the piece before um, as a starting point for then getting back to to uh, better speed and you know I, I, the last thing I want to hear is a performance that's you know you could where you can hear that someone's been practicing with the metronome so the, there obviously comes a point at which you must set that aside uh, but i i found that quite a useful mechanism sure um and and just again just to re-emphasize that the short uh, concentration span thing that maybe half an hour um and then take a break and, and not to do too much in any one day so i i, I wouldn't say that I, yeah, I don't have any other sort of routines or methods to add to that. Well, it's it's still very very helpful. Um, going back to you know career building and artistic development, so um, a lot of people, of course, now use social media as a yeah. sort of promotion tool. Uh, any yeah. thoughts on that? 
Um, yes, I, I mean, I'm aware that, uh, you know, lots of my colleagues and some of them are my friends who use that a lot. Uh, and some of them, in fact, only use social media for that. Uh, and that that's their style. I mean, uh, I, I don't do as much as that, but I'm occasionally happy to, uh, if I get a good review, to put that up and so people can see that. Um, or to say I'm playing this next week or this is being broadcast next week or whatever. Uh, I, I don't... I don't think it's a problem, but I, I mean, I also have a manager, so I expect them to um, uh, also. Well, that, that, that's their job, and you know, they they earn their money from my concerts, and that's a, a that's a perfectly good relationship. Uh, so uh, you know, th they will promote also using social me media from time to time. And may I ask you about this uh, relationship between the artist and the manager? So what should mm. young people uh, sort of really um, think about if they a, want to be signed and then B, when they're signed already? Uh, well, I, I think it's very important to obviously you, you look at you go and see lots of managers and, and try and find the one that you believe will suit you. And um, you need to, uh, once you have signed up with them, you need to absolutely understand that it is a, a symbiotic relationship. It's not, you know, resentment should not be part of it at all. So, you know, I hear so many, have heard so many musicians over the years say, well, oh, my agent's absolutely useless. They don't do anything for me. Mm. Um well, it, it, sometimes this might happen. I, I mean, in my own case, um, I've been very fortunate in the last, uh, I've had very few agents, but uh, uh, the last, I, I've got a fantastic new one at the moment. The, the company I was with for um, nearly 30 years, nearly 30 years, uh, went into voluntary liquidation right at, even before the uh, lockdown. And uh, so I found myself just for two or three days without a manager. But uh, a lot of the work that I do comes to me directly, or it might be my own festivals, mm -hmm. uh, my own sure. uh, series that I direct, as I'm artistic director of. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, they take commission on those dates. Mm -hmm. And I accept mm -hmm. that. That is, that is part of the relationship. And, and then, of course, I'm expecting and hoping that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm also in a position to occasionally say to my manager, well, um, you know, I haven't heard from this promoter for a bit. Would you mind just getting in touch with them and seeing what, what's happening? Yeah. Uh, you expect the manager to be proactive. And if they're not being proactive, then that's not a good thing. But you can't expect them to do everything for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And... Um... I mean, these times they present challenging, of course, for performers, but also for the agents as well, right? Yeah, so it's, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's a very difficult time, I think, and concert halls yeah. and, and everything. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you have any sort of uh, prognosis, maybe a personal one, about how this will all develop in the UK? Uh, well, I mean, it, it all depends on what happens with the, the infection rate, doesn't it? I, I think, uh, you know, if the infection rate is going down, uh, which it has been doing, um, I, I think we're a long way away yet from it being in a place where the social distancing measures can be relaxed. That is the most important thing as far as the future of, of uh, the music business is concerned. And it's already happening elsewhere. I mean, I, I have... Um, uh, a student who's locked down in Barcelona at the moment or near Barcelona and he was saying that concerts are already being planned in Spain but they're, they're very small audiences socially distanced and with live streaming mm -hmm. uh, so, but I, I think you know it, it, we've had a, a very difficult situation in the in the UK I don't want to go political but it's not been it's not as successful uh, and uh, there's been a you know, it, it hit us very badly. And um, I think people are, you know, quite rightly worried um, about the future and whether uh, it's time to think, you know, it's that we should be getting ready to open concert halls. I think there's still too many infections for that. And of course... Uh, so, I mean, I'm just... 
Well, just finally, I'll just say that I, I'm just hoping that by the beginning of next year, if there hasn't been a second spike, then that things might ease dramatically from that point onwards. Sure. Um, and what is your attitude towards live streaming? Do you think it's a good thing? Uh, I, I've done a bit of it. Um, I don't have a, a view on it. I mean, usually it's, it doesn't uh, amount to any increase in the fee. Um, uh, but I, I think it's also a good way of getting, you know, promotion and uh, you know the, the fact that people can, you know, in the comfort of their own homes, watch your recital in Madrid, which happened to me a few years ago. Um, then you know th that can only be a good thing, can't it? Providing it goes well. <laughs> but but I, I think I've done enough. I've done enough live broadcasts over the years on the BBC not to be worried about that. Uh, well, you worry about it a bit beforehand, but once you're out there doing it, you've got to concentrate on the music. Um, so, um, what's with your own festivals? I know you mentioned you're very busy. I know you're really a director of many, many, many things and wonderful things. So, what is the strategy for, for your plans? Just on hold or are you standing planning already something? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're on hold at the moment. I mean, the... Uh, the Manchester Chamber Concert Society, which I, I'm artistic director of, uh, where we've got a season starting on the 12th of October, uh, but we've got various contingency plans, uh, which we will take up uh, um, at the appropriate moment. So you know, if, if the best scenario is obviously that the season goes ahead, we may defer the first half of it and try and fit those at the end of the season because it finishes in March. Um, actually, no, it finishes in April next year. But uh, we may just transfer, the, a lot of people are doing this, and we may do that, transfer the whole season uh, another year ahead. So as far as future, future planning is concerned, no is the answer. None of that at the moment. Right. We just have to wait and see what's happening here. The Ribble Valley International Piano Week, which I've been doing for 30 years now, um, uh, we're hanging on to one date in October as our... Mm -hmm. Uh, 2020 festival uh, which will be a lunchtime concert and an evening concert if that can't happen then we'll try and put the whole festival on uh, in July which is when the festival usually is July 2021 mm. yeah gosh um, slightly changing the subject uh, you, you mentioned uh, this a couple of times you're teaching of course you're very busy yes yes I've been. Um, I'm sure you, like many, have found it difficult. But has there been any um, sort of revelations for you in online teaching? Uh, revelations. Uh, it's much harder than teaching one to one, face to face. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, it's it's more tiring, uh, I think, and uh, especially the the FaceTime ones. It's slightly more. I find, you know, after an hour and a half of that, I'm I'm ready for a bit of a rest. Uh, but um, whereas normally, I mean, living in the north as I do, and I travel to London to teach, I will I can go down to London, maybe stay overnight, start the next morning, and teach eight hours without a break. And I've got the best class of students I've ever had at the moment at the Guildhall, and uh, I never feel tired because I just think, oh, it's such a body next. Uh, right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And such a body next. And, and uh, at the end of it, then I catch the train back to Cumbria. Um, but of course with online stuff, I find that I, I want to restrict myself to one a day uh, because the other thing is that you, if it's a, a video or um, an audio recorder you're listening to, you've got to make notes in your score and then you've got to get onto the email and, and, type it all up and then send it up and then possibly you have a face-to-face -face zoom or facetime afterwards with the student yeah so it, it it's uh, yeah it, it has to be done there's no, there's no uh, way other way of doing it at the moment and uh, but it's very important for the student and for me uh, as the teacher to to keep that contact <clears throat> 
And what what is your um, let's say um, motivation? Um, let's say what what motivation do you use um, for, to encourage your students to practice? Because I think it's very hard for someone who is um, younger um, this time, especially. I mean, I I don't want to say it's not hard for those who are older, but just um, it sometimes feels that you study for a career that might not happen at all. Well, I think that's that's true. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, they're all on courses which uh, have an outcome. Um, and, uh, you know, if they want their undergraduate degree or their postgraduate degree uh, or their artist diploma, then <clears throat> obviously they have to practice and, and pass the exam, which is often at the moment is going to be done usually, but not e exclusively remotely. Um, I, I I do expect a student to have their own motivation. I mean, I, I can have a conversation with them if I feel that there's a serious lack of motivation uh, and not much work is being presented to me. Um, uh, but, you know, they're, they're adults. They, they, they have their own minds, their own personalities, and, you know, it, it's really up to them to do it. And, I, I mean, in... 95 and even 99 percent of the cases of students i've worked with over the years there's never been any problem sure uh, and my final question um any words of wisdom to anyone who is passionate about piano playing well i i think um to keep that freshness uh, and and your passion in the music is the most important thing of all your your love of the music is the most important thing of all because if you have that love and you've done your homework your, your hard work on the piano then that will come through to your listeners um <laughs> this just came into my mind that i hadn't thought of it before don't try and imitate too many great pianists from mm. the past not in the same piece, anyway. <laughs> I think uh, I think uh, I've never been guilty of this, but I can think of a few colleagues in times gone by who would be able to tell you, you know, how every recording of the opening of Beethoven's Opus 111 where it goes. You know, say, well, Polini does it like this, but Brendel does it like this, and, uh, and, and if you're not careful, you become obsessed with what they're doing rather than what Beethoven asks you to do and what you feel also from your your own training uh, and your own experience um, as, as time goes on. Uh, I, I once uh, and, uh, had a conversation with the, uh, the late great pianist, who actually he was a great influence on me, Clifford Curzon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he, he said to me, uh, you know, one of the most amazing things about this job, he was probably about my age now when I, when I had this conversation with him, so a long time ago. And um, he, he said, one of the most amazing things about this job, he called it a job, is, um, is the way you think about Opus 111 when you're 20, the way you think about it when you're 30. The way you think about it when you're 40, 50, 60, and the differences between. And I found that very interesting, actually. In my view, for example, of a piece I've been playing since I was 20, is the Beethoven Opus 110. I have a very different view of it now from what I had when I was 17, when I first learned it. So, um, yeah, never lose the freshness. Always have the love of the music at the forefront. And don't overdo the hours. <laughs> and that was Martin Roscoe. Um, thank you very much. It was such an interesting My pleasure. Really fantastic. And I've learned so much. I'm not sure about the listeners. I'm sure they, they do, but I can tell you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. And and bye. And have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.